I've discovered that younger uh, students and even some younger faculty really don't know about Rachel Carson. She wrote Silent Spring in 1962. It was an uh, incredible bestseller. It took on the question of pesticides, particularly DDT, but others that were harming birds. So Silent Spring is based on a, uh, a quote from Keats about no birds sing. Uh, and so many people associate it just with the birds. And when we banned and reduced DDT, the birds and the eagles came back, and Rachel and others can be credited with that. But most of the book is about human health and the effects of DDT and other toxins on humans. In my book, I try to capture that Rachel Carson was not only a lone literary genius, she was quite politically active, and she stood on the shoulders of many scientific ge geniuses and giants before her. Women are the ones I focus on, and many have come after. So, you know, my hope is that with, with young women that I speak to on college campuses or here at the School of Public Health, that they will be inspired by these women and understand that all of the issues we care about are connected, that to get serious prevention as a public health issue, you really have to take on public policy and change and prevent things upstream, whether it's tobacco companies, chemical companies, as Rachel Carson did. So it's very clear that Rachel Carson was connected to a whole set of very interesting people connecting up civil rights, progressive causes, and the like. And she was definitely not alone uh, in all of this. She was surrounded by women who were quite supportive of her. And she was part of organized environmentalism. She was quite political. She worked with the Kennedy administration, with Stuart Udall, the Secretary of the Interior, worked on an early version of trying to get an environment department, a conservation department, legislation, wrote speeches for people. Uh, she was very active politically. And she had women who were her close friends and colleagues. And one of them was her literary agent named Marie Rodell. And she helped plan the launch of Silent Spring, which was sort of like Al Gore's movie, Inconvenient Truth. It just didn't happen to be a best-selling documentary. Environmental groups and others had people come to the showings. And with Silent Spring, Marie Rodell, with others, planned this huge Washington launch. They had things all over the country. They were prepared to be attacked, as Rachel was, because she took on chemical corporations. And because DDT had been used successfully during World War II to protect our troops, uh, the Marines in the South Pacific, GIs in Italy, citizens there to prevent typhus, malaria. It was this wonder, wonder chemical. And there, but there already were signs of human health long-term effects. There have been studies at Patuxent uh, right here in Maryland that Rachel Carson was aware of in 1945. She tried to write an article, a popular article, for Reader's Digest. You know, I could do an article about how people are being harmed by DDT. And Reader's Digest said, like, you know, boring, grim. I don't think so, Rachel. No, thank you. And it wasn't until 1962 when the public became outraged because they were spraying DDT over everything to kill gypsy moths, fire ants, uh, and mosquitoes, anything that moved. And the corporations that were producing it tried to prevent the publication of Silent Spring. They threatened lawsuits. The Velsicor Corporation up in Michigan that produces a lot of this stuff. Um, and so before the book came out, Rachel Carson and her allies and her friends, women, said, you know, we know we're going to be attacked. And so we need to be prepared. And they created a whole network of allies and people who were supporting them. Today, what we need and have, but it still has to be bigger, is reaching out to the broad public. That's what Rachel Carson did. I mean, with bestsellers, this is one of my goals, two years on the New York Times bestseller list. She was a beloved writer. It's how she had such impact. So reaching the general public, step one. She ended up on television with Eric Severide. John F. Kennedy was asked at a press conference if he was doing anything about pesticides. And he said, uh, 
Why, yes, uh, we've all seen Ms. Cawson's book, and uh, we're going to be looking into that. And what that means is, of course, they all knew about this. He put together a task force. It validated all of the science that Rachel had published in a single book. She worked with others. Uh, so reaching the public is one piece, what we call now the grassroots, ordinary citizens, absolutely critical. Working with scientists, public health professionals, getting the credibility, that's also what Rachel Carson did. And then taking action collectively as professionals and professional associations or in environmental groups or public health groups and pushing on our government that is what makes the rules about how much coal we can burn or not, what kind of mileage we have in our vehicles, whether they're polluting the skies and letting out carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. There is really, in my view, no other way to go about this. And that is why Rachel Carson is such an iconic figure of starting the modern environmental movement. There had always been a nature movement, a conservation movement, worried about the birds, the robins, the eagles. There had been environmental health, women deeply involved here at Hopkins. But the two had never really been put together. Bring a, the naturalists, the birders, the botanists on the one hand, with the people studying chemicals and toxins and neighborhoods and workers. That's, to me, one of the great contributions of Rachel Carson. She mixes everything that we as humans who care about our fellow humans or the animals and the birds need to mix. We have to understand these scientific questions and be credible about that. We have to then be able to communicate it in ways that people can understand and care about. And then we have to take some action and not be afraid of the consequences. One of the women in my book is a biologist and writer named Sandra Steingraber. And she was actually a published poet before she finished up a PhD uh, in biology at the University of Michigan. And uh, she wrote a book, she's written a number of books, but one called Living Downstream. Uh, an ecologist looks at uh, cancer and the environment. She got a rare form of bladder cancer at age 20. And unlike in the day with Rachel Carson, where Rachel only discussed it with, she had a very close friend named Dorothy Freeman. She demanded that it never be mentioned. She was also afraid that they would think that her research and writing was biased because she had breast cancer. And people didn't talk about it in those days. They whispered the words behind closed doors. Even by the 1970s, where a modern writer, Sandra Steingraber, discovered at age 20 that she had uh, bladder cancer. This was in the 70s. Her roommate, she went to the doctor, she came back, and her roommate had moved out. It was like she was afraid she might catch something. It was like the early days of HIV AIDS, only it was just cancer. Uh, it was just something you didn't do. So Sandra writes very directly and personally about it, wants people to understand how and why it can come from the environment. So her book, traces uh, central Illinois where she grew up. She uses toxic release inventory data, TRA data, for what chemicals might have been dumped near her girlhood home. Cancer registries to figure out what kinds of clusters and, and, and what incidents there were in central Illinois. Uh, and then writes also beautifully and lyrically about it. Uh, and so for me, uh, the role of, of scientists is, is one that has to speak bravely and openly about whatever is going on, your own cancer. Uh, in the old days, people said it's too personal, it will look biased. Uh, you can't mix your own story with the science. But I think we understand now that if as public health professionals, uh, we're going to reach people, who don't happen to be sitting at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, then we have to communicate as fellow human beings and tell stories and talk about our own lives and how we got to where we are. The environmental movement is larger and more sophisticated than people realize, but they don't own the media like Rupert Murdoch. They don't have untrammeled billions like the Koch brothers. Um, so they generally are outspent in campaigns, 10 to 1, 40 to 1, depending. Uh, 
um, but they create films, they have blogs, they uh, are constantly putting out reports for the media, appearing in the media. Uh, I think one of the problems is that their message is fairly complicated uh, with, let's say, the antis who aren't, you know, or who want to keep mining and burning coal no matter what. Uh, their message, and generally, I guess I'll call it an ultra-conservative message, is, is fairly simple. You know, it's God, country, flag. Uh, it's, yes, the business of America is business. It's what Charles Wilson once said, uh, you know, uh, about General Motors, I think. Um, you know, and we have this strong feeling that we're an entrepreneurial country, we build a great economy, and what's good for business should be good for America. Um, if we stand by the flag and never question. Um, so those are pretty simple messages to put out. The, the environmental movement, in trying to describe the causes of global climate change, which are complex and difficult, same with some of the effects of chemicals. They're rather subtle and hard to detect, and some of the health outcomes take a long time to develop. So if you say, am I going to get cancer from this particular water or this bottle, well, you can only talk statistically that there are materials in there that if they leach into the water and if you absorb them, then your risk of developing cancer will be higher over a long period of time, etc. Meanwhile, the other side saying, I can't have all these regulations on my utilities, on my water, your bill's going to go up, you know, we don't want to pay more. So it's a bit of an uneven battlefield. And that's why I try to get students, public health professionals, and others engaged. We need more people to take what they know, what they care about, their backyard, their birds, their butterflies, their mother with cancer, put it all together and say we have to stop all of the causes of these ills that these health people have been telling us about from chemicals, from climate change, and the rest and get involved, that's what this republic was designed for.